I want to welcome you all, and I'm happy to be here for this Millennial Takeover. We are doing a segment called the Millennial Dating Chronicles, right? The Millennial Dating Chronicles. And the Millennial Dating Chronicles is a web series that I created that shares the lives of young adults as they navigate this big, tricky, confusing arena called dating. The good, the ratchet, the bad, all of it. And so these stories that they share are intended to inspire and educate you of how to best navigate your own personal relationship. I, I did some studies on a Pew, a, a 2019 Pew Research Center study. Very recent, October uh, 2019 date, very accurate, very thorough report. And it said that overall, church and Christianity membership is declining overall, based upon uh, the numbers that they, they have uh, shown us. And then they said the Generation X and the Baby Boomers are declining in church attendance, and they did define church attendance as those people who, return, who, uh, who regularly ch uh, attend church once a month or more. That was declining by 8%. But millennials' uh, church attendance was declining by 22%. 22%. So I was wondering, based upon that, and I wanted to talk about, we can talk about like what the reason that is for and why that is, but I wanted to talk about what that impact is on your dating and your relationships, and how does the exodus of millennials in the church affect you in your dating relationships? So let me first ask the singles who are here. Do you, are you affected by any of that? Miss April. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> if I can't find but First, when, when, you, when you speak, give your name and your, uh, your uh, age, please. All right, so my name is April Richardson. I am 33. They say don't ask a woman her age. I'm 33. <laughs> um, yes, um, it, it, I am affected because if you can't find a husband in the church, so from my experience, you don't find as many men in the church as you do women. So if you can't, if there's not enough men in the church, how do you find a husband in the church? Okay. So you're usually finding somebody outside of the church and then trying to usher them in. Ah, uh -huh. all right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it Give your name, please. Oh, sorry. My name is Crystal, and I'm 33. But I think it does affect the dating process because most guys that, most guys aren't their self when they come to church. When some guys come to church, they try to portray to be, you know, somebody that they're not outside of church just to, so people won't judge them while they're in church. So I'm not going to, like, I don't, I don't know if I would look for a guy at church, per se, these days. Mm. Because, like I said, they're not being themselves because they don't want to be judged by Christians or So are you saying that the church people that you see, you don't know if they're Christians or not, but they are faking and fronting in church like they are somebody else and they're not? Some, some guys may because, they, like I said, they don't want to be judged by the churchgoers. So they might be going to church mainly because either their mother made them or told them to go that Sunday. or So how are you a grown, whole grown man and your mama still saying you better go to church? I want to hear from some of the guys here who feel, I, I, want, I, I want to know first if you agree with that and if you are one of those fake men. <laughs> All right, so I'm definitely not a faker. Um, I don't think I would be here if okay. I was. I Give us your name, please. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm 29. Um, I do believe that uh, it does affect the dating scene um, because you're not able to find someone who's on the same page as you. We talk about being equally yoked, but a lot of times uh, we think, about, think of it as an unsaved save, but sometimes you can both be saved and still unequally yoked because that person is not on the same level as you spiritually. Um, so I find I myself, if I can't find anybody in my church that already has the same principles and beliefs as me, going outside, like, like you said, going outside having to find someone, even if they're Christian, still possibly having to work with them on certain things. Um, so it, it can work out, it can't, but it does make it harder. So that's interesting because she, April talked about, and Crystal echoed, the fact that uh, there are a lot of men in church, there are not a lot of men in church, and the ones that are in church be faking. And you said that's true too. Do you, so you find oh, some, fake some Christian women in church? Oh, yeah. I'm just something. asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say uh, you, you do find both sides uh, fake occasionally, but I think when you see someone who's consistent, um, who actually has a relationship, then you know there's something real there. 
Um, so if it's someone who's just there every once a month, then yeah, it might, might be kind of fake. Okay. Um, but if you're seeing them there and involved in ministry, it changes up a little bit. Let me hear from another single man here. Wow. Yes, sir. He don't look single. <laughs> he look wifed up and baby inbound. <laughs> go ahead. Give us uh, a name, please. I'm Zach. I'm 22. Um, I was kind of go, like, forced to go to church at first by my parents. When I so was you were that grown I, man I, that was forced I, to go to church. I grew up in the church, so okay. that's, uh, but I've got my own habit going, starting to go to my own church. But um, I was lucky enough to find my beautiful love in church through my sister. And, but it is tough because not everyone's going to have that. You might have to bring someone out of church to church. But I was lucky. I was blessed. And like you were saying about it's all been genuine and real. And that's how the love's just been, just Christ-centered relationships. And that's an immensely important. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So if there are, I, I heard that you said that, are you single, bro? No, I didn't think so. Um, I heard that you said that you found your uh, mate in church. Yeah. Okay. Are you married? Uh, no. Dating. Not yet. Dating. Okay. I don't want to put that on you. I don't want to put that on you. Okay. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that I, I even have in my notes here about um, how the church has become the place where you do not meet your mate. There was a study that was done uh, by a researcher uh, by the name of uh, Michael Rosenfeld. He did a great research study. I'm like a research nerd, so I like, I don't just look at the research reports that, that people say, oh, there's a study that's been done about this topic. I go and read the actual whole research to make sure that the findings are accurate. So there was a great nine-year, eight-year study done between 2007, no, 2009 and 2017 that looked at how people met. And they talked about how people met and what platforms they met and the way that they met, and then they followed up with them every two years subsequently to find out if they were still together. And what they said is that the church used to be the place where you would meet people, but now the church, only people meet, the only way that you meet somebody from church, uh, or let me rephrase it, only 4% of the people that you, are couples met in church. And so I was wondering if the millennials, this exodus, is tied to that. But I see we have couples here. So I wanted to ask, where did you all meet? And either one of you can go. Uh, where did you all meet uh, your mates, and how did that happen? Um, I met my mate in church. Okay. 4%. You catch, rolled the dice and got it. <laughs> Praise God. We've been married 10 years, okay. and we were together 16 total. So um, I really feel for my fellow millennials when I hear them talk about the dating scene now. I'm sorry, did, did you give your name? I'm your sorry, age? Michelle, and okay. I'm 37. Okay. Um, they talk about how it is hard to date these days, and um, I don't necessarily identify with that. We were able to meet. Well, you married. You've been married for 10 years. How, of course you don't identify with that. <laughs> Come on, Michelle. That's not fair for the people out here struggling in these streets. I know, I, and I hear it's a real struggle. And I'm, I'm, all I can say is I was, I was blessed to meet my mate when I So did. you did meet your mate in church? Yes. Okay. And one of the things that I found when I was coming up, and I've been married 22 years, my wife and I have been doing uh, relationship consulting and coaching and mentoring uh, young adults, millennials, couples for 20 years. Actually, this month celebrates our 20th year in serving in the community. <laughs> And so one of the things that I, I noticed that the, 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 the circle that we had around us was not only helping us identify the things that we wanted to ascribe to be like, but it also was protecting us from different teachings and the different perspectives and different things that were coming in to the community that we could have been subjected to, like a lot of different prophets are coming through, a lot of different people talking about different things. So if you have a community of people that are sort of exiting the church, where do you find your community? Where do you find that spiritual growth? And, and how are you all doing that? Any one of you? I just have one. Um, it was stated earlier in um, the men's segment how we are the church. Um, this is a millennial panel. Times have changed. And that's one thing that um, we've recognized at our church. Um, Cliff and I are the leaders of our young adult ministry. Millennials aren't coming into the church. The church, you have to go where they are. So a church isn't necessarily the building the church is, I mean, we are the church. We have to be the church. We have to go to where they are. When I was in college, um, even though I was born and raised in the church, while I was there, I came from South Carolina. When I first came, I didn't have a church. I didn't have a church home. Um, when I was an athlete, we, I was a part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That was my community. We had our Bible study groups. We had things like that. It wasn't necessarily a church building, but that was my connection 
that was my fellowship with other um, believers and church members. So you can find that, you know, anywhere, your same, you know, vibe that you have. It's not necessarily the building that older generations look for. So if it's not the building, uh, what is it? It's the fellowship. It's people who are like-minded with you. Um, I sense that connection with, with Cliff, and we okay. were in the training room. I mean, it wasn't. So who here agrees with that? Mm -hmm. Audience agrees with that? Okay, you want to say something, Adrian? I would like to also say that social media has a big influence on it as well. Um, today, you can go onto YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and get filled. Um, like, for instance, YouTube, um, sometimes I watch Transformation Church, and then you have movements like Sarah Jake Roberts, and different things that come across our social media, and that's what millennials are about, so if they feel they have the convenience to be able to be at home on their phones, on their computers, or on their iPads and be able to get what they need. They don't necessarily feel the need to go to a physical church. Can I say something? So I, I totally agree. I feel like we saw it wrong. Well, I'm going to say we. I feel like it was taught wrong when we were taught that the building is the church because it's not. It's the people. Um, I feel like there's a disconnect with the millennials now because we do have social media. Right, right. And being a social media manager, um, I don't quite, because it's not just about what we see and what we are listening to, it's about the connection. Mm -hmm. So being able to go out in the street and connect with each individual, that's where it's at. But then at the same point, what we got to start learning is we need to go to the people. You know, like, I, it can't just be good enough to say I'm going to watch YouTube and I'm filled. No, there's, there, there's, there's got to be that point where we go meet people where they are and not expect everybody to come to the building. Let's go meet people where they're at. That's good. Who else? Nope. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was going to say, adding on to that, um, one thing that has scared me about our generation is that a lot of times we, we do believe that we can just do the social media part, where we can just look at the online videos, um, we can look at the, the lives on, on Sunday and not actually have the actual community. Um, because that's the most important part, the accountability. I mean, you're not going to get accountability from watching a video every Sunday. You, you need to actually be, be amongst a, a fellowship or a congregation to have that accountability, have someone, hey, can you pray for me about this? Like, you know, this is what I'm going through. If you don't have that, then you really don't have church. So I, I think that, um, that it's an integral piece to have the online social media aspect, but it has to be coupled with um, actual physical meeting with the That's fellowship. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Um, so, and my name's Jonathan, by the way, and what I was gonna say is there's so many things competing for your attention nowadays. You had a generation of people who come in from slavery, maybe they couldn't read, they didn't have access to a lot of different places, and their faithfulness in their habits got blessed it. Right. And then church not only became church, but church became a business. Right. And I think that we're in the place the Bible talks about having a generation with the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We know how to clap. We know how to look right. We know how to wear my holy dress when maybe I had on a skirt that if I sneeze, it was going to be above my belly button last night. Right. Or I heard uh, Jackie McCullough say some of the dudes in the choir that pants so tight that she could see the credit card number from the back row. So it's not just a lady thing. Right. Um, but I mean, then so you expand it out to a televangelist and you see, you see inconsistency in behavior. You do see false prophets. Expand that out even more to the information age was I think with you know, Generation X and then technology in this millennial age, right? So you have all of these different things competing for your attention. You got people thinking that they self-help or spiritual, or even amongst Christians where their Christianity isn't biblically based, right? So you got all of these different things to navigate. I think that what you really need and what I hope that God pours out into this generation, and I think we really just need a return to the manifestation of his spirit, right? Yeah. What people need in every walk of life, right? So many families failing you. Politics is failing you. Your job is failing you. I just need somebody to come through. I need somebody to come through, and I need somebody to be honest, right? Because I remember when I got older, the ladies with the deaconess pins and the sequence hat and the soft mints that were on you about the way you dressed. I love them soft when, mints. When them you soft showed mints up, fire. Right? And you can't take communion if you don't have a doily on your head. Or my sisters, because I came up Pentecostal, so if it was fun, you're going to hell. Um, Right. But you had to bring a skirt. But it's all of these things. But you didn't never really realize, well, how come sister so and so don't ever have a husband. Right. But the Bible says in in Hebrews that you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. Right. Sometimes we make it look too cute. Sometimes we make it look too easy where you need to open up your mouth because God will give us as believers grace 
to shield us, to give us the opportunity to open our mouth and say what we've been through. But I think if we do that, yeah, I smoke weed. Yeah, I had a baby outside of wedlock. Yes, I committed adultery, but God is still gracious. God is still a healer. God is still a keeper. And I'm still showing up and I'm still making it. I'm not perfect. And it's just like, oh, right? You know, I wasn't birthed in TBN and walked into the poor pit. I'm a human person, but through the grace and the perfection of God, I can still be cool and make it. I can still wear J's and make it. I can still hoop and make it. I can still be on Twitter and make it, you know? And I think if people connect to that, then the church can be more relevant. And when there's relevant, they don't need to seek answers from them. Amen. Amen. You've been holding that for a good while. You've been holding that. He was holding that. You wanted to um, share something? And then Zach. Okay, I was just going to really piggyback off of what Jonathan said as far as the honesty part in being transparent. Millennials nowadays want to um, relate. They want to, you have to be relatable. A lot of churches, uh, if they have like an older pastor, they're not so relatable. And not even necessarily an older pastor. But let's say they don't, they act like that, oh, I'm, I went from, my mother's womb to being a pastor, but really they didn't, but that's the image that they are portraying. So if they are transparent and let people know, like, I've been through that. Like, yes, I had a child out of wedlock or whatever the case may be, and um, you see where God brought me. So if they show that to the millennial, then they'll be like, okay, I want to come back. And like I said earlier, a lot of millennials don't want to be judged by those older people that are in the church already or so, so to say. Yeah, before you go, Zach, one of the things that I did, uh, I learned, because uh, I, I helped start a millennial ministry at my church uh, where I go to, and we talked about um, how the older generations look down on the way the millennial generations solve problems. And by problems, I mean communication. Not like issue problems, but like world, like, not, like, like the, the problem of communication, how do you do that? Through texting, through social media. How do you solve the problems of uh, getting a job or dealing with stress or dealing with anxiety? Those problems that we, we deal with in older generations such as myself, we had different ways of doing that. We had different coping mechanisms. But millennial generation has different coping, coping mechanisms and they were being talked down to because of how they're dealing with their problems. And because of that, they struggled with accepting other generations' input because you don't accept what my, my problems. You look down on me. So why should I listen to you when all you're saying is just get over it and stop whining and get out the house and, and be independent when you've enabled me and not, and, and not allowed me to be dependent? So that was one of the things that I learned about sort of speaking to off of what you said about being authentic and being real. Go ahead, Zach. So with the numbers you're talking about, with the millennial numbers being down with church, um, I think it is about the judgmental and acceptance. Um, I was going to a Methodist church with my parents and felt like I wasn't growing at all. So I looked and I found a church that I felt accepted in and I found community in. And now I have a community group in my basement with my sister where it's all just raw and we just talk about the issues we all fight every day that maybe is not brought up in church. And I've never felt like closer to my walk of faith because that group and that accountability that we share. And I think that's why people are scared to go to church. It's like an intimidation factor and they just need to find that community. And it doesn't have to be that physical church building we've been talking about today. It would be a coffee shop or my basement. It doesn't yeah, matter. And that's a, that's, a, that's a new trend that I've seen, that people are going outside the walls of church and having a church service in a non-church building. And I've seen that a lot. So um, we've, we're, we've shifted the conversation, and that's fine, to, from away from dating to, uh, I guess, maturity in your walking in the, in, in the spirit as millennial and being mature in Christ as a millennial. Um, I want to ask the question, because I prepared notes for it, I want to ask the question about social media and online dating. Uh, who's down for that? Okay, come on, give it a mic. So I've been on some dating sites. Okay. Um, I, I would probably say one of the biggest errors for all of you single men out there, stop posting pictures of stuff we don't care about. <laughs> So I'll see some pictures with people with big fishes, and like we don't care about that. <laughs> like or pictures where you didn't cut, cut the other girl off. <laughs> you know. So wow. there's. A, I, feel, I feel like there is. The, and then it was a good picture of me. The lighting was perfect. She just. No. Not. I don't want her to be in the picture to throw anything off. So this is me though. So it's, just, it's, just it's my authentic self. But I will say one one issue with 
social media in general, and then now bringing the dating part into it. People do not, now I'm not talking about men, even women, they don't know how to have a conversation. So when it comes to you wanting to actually get to know somebody, it's hi. Okay. Like one-liners, There's we're not continuing a conversation. So you just have the point where, okay, I just, I'm not going to talk to this person. <laughs> so it, it's a But struggle. is that a social media thing? Well, it's, it's partially because we, okay. haven't, we haven't learned how to communicate and, and hold, because we don't have to. We can text. We can, well, you know, we don't have to do it so anymore. So here's, I'm confused now, because I was told that you don't, ex you, you, un you don't understand that texting is a legitimate form of communication for us millennials. And so now that texting is a le legitimate form of communication, it's caused a problem of the lack of communication. I'm confused. Ability to communicate. It, it's caused the issue with the ability to communicate effectively. Okay. Chris. I was going to say effectively because uh, there's so many tones you can have to what you're saying. And through text, it's, it's just words. So you can take it any way you want. Um, I think it's important to, to verbalize and actually have that, spend that quality of time and actually talk about things and really see where each other's minds are. And that's kind of the issue with uh, online dating sometimes. It's it starts off with just text until you get each other's information, numbers, and start talking. I mean, when it stays just text, sometimes something that could be good could end up really horrible because you don't know each other yet. So share about so. your experience, Chris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The horrible um, ones. So, so, so that we can learn from it. It's interesting right? when, learn. when dating online, everyone creates like what I would consider like an avatar of themselves. You know, we have this image we want to show everyone, but that's not really us. So it's really like an Instagram or a Facebook. It's just for dating. So I think the challenge is the communication, actually getting to know the person beyond their appearance that they give off. Because if they're online dating, they're dating other people as well. So they're continuing this facade of who they are throughout all their dates. So they're practicing this, and it's becoming a pattern. So now you're not really spending time with a real person. You're spending time with a facade. Um, I found that happening a lot. Um, to you? To me. Uh -huh. yeah. um, well, you the facade or the one who was facade -ed? See, people I try found, to act I like, they're talking general terms like, you know, this happens in the world. What about you, sir? <laughs> so for me, for me, I, I found that a lot of the people I was meeting, it took a while for me to get to the real them. Um, and a lot of times they had expectations of me already set in their minds. And if I didn't meet those expectations they already had, then it was just, it was whatever. Um, so I think it really comes to a lot of preconceived notions that come from this in, intangibility because it's online. We can't touch it. We can't feel it. We can't see the person. It's, it's kind of it's interesting. So with that, is there any is there, is there like an appropriate way or place to meet someone who's a Christian? Uh, is it is it the the school where you did it, or is it the uh, I don't know where y'all met? Where'd y'all meet? Church. Oh, that's right, the, the four percenters. Uh, is there, is there an a, a acceptable place? Because social media has taken over the most preferred place where couples meet. I don't know if you knew that. 39% of couples met on social media. And that was a research that was done in 2019. So if you are on social media, you have a better chance of meeting someone at a start, than, than you would at a Starbucks or by, at church at 4% or at a friend's house or meeting somebody through a friend? Is, is that an acceptable place or you should just be out there only in church? I, I don't think it's like no specific place to meet someone. Like if you're going out with your friends, you are going, if you, you want to meet someone that has the same entrance, entrances as you. So if you go bowling with a group of your girlfriends and then you notice a group of guys or a group of people on the other side and you find them attractive, then that's a way of meeting someone that is not in church, not on social media. It's just in an area of your interest. And then if you feel like they are there, then they are interested in it too. So you're trying to find someone in the, with the same interests as you. That's very good. So those of you all who are still single, do you all have a uh, Naomi in your life? Y'all know Naomi from the book of Ruth. <laughs> Naomi was the one who told Ruth to go down to the barn yeah. and lay at the foot of Boaz, uncover his feet. And so in the midnight hour when Boaz was startled and was awoken, he said, oh, young lady, what are you doing down here at the bottom of my feet? He said, I was cold and, you know, can you give me some of your blanket to cover me up? And he said, you are a more righteous woman 
because you are not out here very thoughtful and running around chasing all these young men who have money that you could be out there, but you're here with me, this old man sleeping. So now I'm going to be your kinsman redeemer and hook you up the next time we see you. But <laughs> do you have somebody that's giving you wisdom and counsel, especially for the, you like Zach, and I want to hear from Zach because he's got a girlfriend, um, give him wisdom and counsel as you, as you navigate and move through this arena. All right, so I definitely had this group in my life, whether it's my sister, friends, my mentor, um, and they all just told me to be patient, and actually she's my first girlfriend and my only girlfriend I've ever had. Wow. In 22 years, yeah. Wow. Um, I made a list of qualities I looked for in a wife, prayed for it every night, and don't settle. Yeah. Because I wasn't going to settle, and I didn't. That's good. But yeah, just listen to your peers, prayer, um, yeah. Okay, good. Anybody else? I would definitely say, um, for me, it's my, my parents. They're, they're a big uh, base for me. Like, they're kind of my vetting process, you know, as far as m meeting somebody or uh, just getting, in, just getting uh, advice from them. Um, them, my pastor, uh, my mentor, and my close actual friends, I would say. That's good. Say, Go ahead. My kids. <laughs> <laughs> Almost kids? everybody that I even consider my, you know, mm-mm. <laughs> so. Yeah, my kids. That's, that's very interesting. That's a new one. Um, for those of you who are married, uh, for the men, uh, what were you, Mr. Boaz, looking for when you were noticing your wives? Uh, uh, character. Character. That's very general because it's, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can try to so break it down. That's another sanctified little. answer you've given there. I mean, maybe it's just where I am. I don't know. I probably shouldn't even be up here. I'm 39. I'm not even... I might be on the wrong group, but anyway. Uh, no, uh, there are a lot of, uh, you, call, you call each other packages earlier. There's a lot of beautiful packages out there. Uh, but a lot of them aren't sure who they are, so they're empty. So you want a beautiful package with more of the treasure on the inside. That's what I mean by character. Well, thank you all, millennials, for joining us today for this Millennial Dating Chronicles. Aren't you glad that they shared their stories? And we appreciate you coming through for this Millennial Takeover on the Elevate Your Life talk show. And we will see you next time. Declare to you the past is